Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, will cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home and I'll put the kettle on. September is one of my favorite months and there are many cozy themes connected with this time of year. As I've considered those themes, I've taken to heart the words of Gladys Tabor in her Still Meadow Day book. She reminds us that, quote, conversation at tea time should be tranquil a time to rest the spirit and remember pleasant things. And so you can be sure that we will linger over pleasant things throughout each episode here at Idlewild Cottage. Today's pleasant thing is the apple orchard. We'll enjoy some book selections, poetry, nature study, a memorable movie scene, a painting, and even a tea blend, all paying tribute to this idyllic autumn setting. Let's jump right in with one of my all-time favorite books, Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. The final chapter is delightfully situated in an apple orchard. Listen in to this opening paragraph. There were a great many holidays at Plumfield, and one of the most delightful was the yearly apple picking. The old orchard wore its holiday attire, Goldenrod and asters fringed the mossy walls. Crickets chirped like fairy pipers at a feast. Squirrels were busy with their small harvesting, and every tree stood ready to send down its shower of apples at the first shake. Everybody was there. Everybody laughed and sang. Everybody declared that there never had been such a perfect day or such a jolly set to enjoy it, and everyone gave themselves up to the simple pleasure of the hour. I'm really drawn to this idea of giving ourselves up to the simple pleasure of the hour. Carving out beauty and joy in a day that might otherwise feel hectic or even mundane can be so life-giving. Now, most of us probably don't have an apple orchard to frolic in and we admittedly won't find the perfect day. But how might we unearth the simple pleasures of an hour, or maybe even just 15 minutes? Today, I encourage you to think about what that might look like for you. It will come as no surprise that one of my favorite ways to do this is by regularly setting aside time for afternoon tea. A very fitting tea for our time together today is the Little Women Orchard House Blend by Harney & Sons. Now, typically I prefer a black tea with cream and sugar, but this green tea with sweet apple notes is just light and lovely. Add a swirl of honey, rustle up a tea biscuit or two to nibble on, and voila, a simple pleasure. So let's imagine I'm pouring out this orchard house blend into dainty teacups. Then as you sip and savor here in the sitting room, I'll share a bit of poetry. Helen Hunt Jackson was an American poet who lived from 1830 to 1885. Her poem, September, is one of my favorite seasonal poems, and I first discovered it in the classic anthology, Favorite Poems Old and New. In this poem, you'll hear our nod to the apple orchard in the first stanza. September by Helen Hunt Jackson. The goldenrod is yellow, the corn is turning brown, the trees in apple orchards with fruit are bending down, the gentian's bluest fringes are curling in the sun, in dusty pods the milkweed its hidden silk has spun, the sedges flaunt their harvest in every meadow nook, and asters by the brookside make asters in the brook. From dewy lanes at morning the grapes' sweet odors rise, At noon, the roads all flutter with yellow butterflies. By all these lovely tokens, September days are here. With summer's best of weather, 
and autumn's best of cheer. When my kids were little, I used to post this poem in the dining room every September. They gradually committed a few lines to memory, which of course was cute and sweet, but they especially liked to emphasize the fourth stanza and shout from dewy lanes at morning. I think they really got a kick out of that word dewy. And of course, we still find ourselves quoting that line today. You know, something else we did years ago was to observe and sketch the growth of an apple tree. This might be a fun activity to bring into your own homes. Starting in early spring and then on through apple harvest, we'd clip a little branch from our lone apple tree, maybe a 10 to 12 inch branch, and bring it to the kitchen table. With colored pencils on white paper, we sketched the development of those branches month by month. So the first sketches showed tiny buds on the branches, and then as time went by, our sketches showed the pink-tinged blossoms, and finally, the rosy red fruit. It was a simple and fun way to include all ages in nature study. Alrighty, let's saunter on over to Green Gables now. I like to think that Idlewild Cottage is situated just a stone's throw from Green Gables, or maybe from Orchard House. I actually can't make up my mind on that one. But really, I have Anne Shirley to thank for the name Idlewild. Today, we'll first visit a cinematic version of Anne. As I thought of movies with some kind of an apple orchard setting in them, I have to admit that not many came to mind, but one that did is well worth revisiting. Anne of Avonlea, the movie from 1987, differs in many, many ways from the book by Lucy Maud Montgomery, but I still find it to be very charming in its own right. For one thing, the costumes are great. I especially love Anne's plaid vest and that brown Edwardian skirt number in the opening scenes, super chic. And then her hairstyles throughout the film surpass the puffed sleeves of her youth as the puffiest in the world. They are really fantastic, though my husband expresses a differing opinion. He is inclined to refer to this series as the one where she has ginormous hair. Well, anyway, it happens that Anne is at her simplest in this classic apple orchard scene. She's on a ladder wearing an apron and straw hat, harvesting apples as Gilbert saunters into the orchard. He invites Anne for a stroll down the lane and alas, she has an engagement to keep with her friend Catherine and our hearts momentarily break for Gilbert, but she offers a beacon of hope. How about I walk you across the pond? Still toting the apple basket, they make their way to the bridge. It's here that Anne reflects. I've discovered it's not what the world holds for you. It's what you bring to it. And it's here that all is right in the world of Anne and Gilbert. If you'll allow me a few more minutes to linger with Anne Shirley and Gilbert Blythe, I'll make my way over to the third book in the Anne series, Anne of the Island, written in 1915. In chapter two, Gilbert has suggested they take a ramble back through the woods beyond the marsh in hopes of finding an old apple tree. Here are a few excerpts. The woods around the head of the marsh were full of purple vistas threaded with gossamers. Past a dour plantation of gnarled spruces and maple-fringed, sun-warm valley, they found the something Gilbert was looking for. Ah, here it is, he said with satisfaction. An apple tree! And away back here, exclaimed Anne delightedly. Yes, a veritable apple-bearing apple tree, too, here in the midst of pines and beeches, a mile away from any orchard. I was here one day last spring and found it all white with blossom. So I resolved I'd come again in the fall and see if it had been apples. See, it's loaded. They look good, too, tawny as russets, but with a dusky red cheek. Most wild seedlings are green and uninviting. I suppose it sprang years ago from some chance sown seed, said Anne dreamily, and how it has grown and flourished and held its own here all alone among aliens, 
the brave, determined thing. The apples proved to be delicious. Under the tawny skin was a white, white flesh, faintly veined with red, and besides their own proper apple taste, they had a certain wild, delightful tang no orchard-grown apple ever possessed. I often listen to audiobooks while I'm walking, and I've discovered a great narrator, Karen Savage, who has read several of the Anne books. If you'd like to linger a bit longer with Anne of the Island, you can find it on LibriVox. There are a few versions of Anne of the Island, so be sure to look for the one narrated by Karen Savage. As we savor the last few sips of our tea here in the sitting room of Idlewild Cottage, let's imagine there's a carved wooden picture frame hung on the wall. This frame is enchanted, and it holds whichever work of art we wish to admire in the moment. Well, today, our frame displays a watercolor painting called The Apple Harvest by Swedish artist Carl Larsson. It was painted in 1903. If you give it a Google, you can find it pretty quickly. I love the whimsical quality and colors in this piece. Really, all of Larson's work is nostalgic and charming and inviting. You just want to be in the painting. Now, there's one more place I'd like us to linger before we go our separate ways, and that's in the Book of Psalms. During my own afternoon tea time, I prioritize three things. I begin by reading a psalm, then I jot down a few things I'm grateful for in my gratitude journal. And finally, I read a chapter or so from whichever book I happen to be reading. And so, as we wrap up our time today, I'd love to invite you into this rhythm of reading from the Psalms. My prayer for us, both in our time together here at Idlewild Cottage, and then as we head back into the flurry of the day's activity, is that we will be like the tree of Psalm 1. Maybe today we can imagine it's an apple tree. Here are a few lines from the New Living Translation. Oh, the joys of those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Kindred spirits, may you flourish along the streams of water wherever the Lord has planted you. And may your fruit be as the delightful, tangy wild apples discovered by Anne and Gilbert, cultivated uniquely and abundantly for the joy of the Lord and the blessing of others. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage.